everybody taking time out of their day to tune in to listen to us go on and on and on. I am Chris Irons from Strata Consultancy Firm Strata Solve. And alongside, as always, Frank Higginson, Partner Heinz Legal Strata Expert of Renown. Frank, welcome. <laughs> Hello. And wearing a shirt that reflects the heat that we've been copying the last couple of days. So, uh, yes, today's a relaxing day. Uh, good. No, that's how it should be too. These days should be like that, I think. Um, uh, don't forget to like and share and, and just basically get involved, everybody who's watching and listening. Um, the reason for that, uh, apart from it being an engaging exercise, is you actually can get a different perspective on things that you had not found out before. If somebody posts a question or somebody posts a comment, you might actually find out something that you weren't quite privy to previously. So. Get involved. Uh, we will try and answer as many questions slash comments as we get live today. So feel free to pop uh, comments and queries in there. And if uh, you have a more detailed query today, uh, we'll put a link up shortly where you can put that more detailed query. It's just a um, form easier to fill in and asking it here. Today, Frank, uh, we're going to talk about a subject that I think you and I get approached about chat. We chat with people all the time. It's one that comes up a lot, isn't it? And it's about an administrator. For a body corporate, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it's it's interesting. Um, so when you think about this, there's lots of parallels throughout, I suppose you would say society, but in a legal perspective where someone can be appointed to make decisions for other people. Um, and that can be voluntarily or by force. So, you know, the voluntary way, of course, is a power of attorney. Chris, if I give you a power of attorney, subject to what the terms of that power of attorney is, you can sign documents, you could administer medicine, you can yep. go to my bank account and clean it out and do all those things that you otherwise want to do. Um, and then, and really what we're talking about today, I suppose, is the forced removal of someone's rights to make decisions. So in uh, normal day-to-day -day sense, um, you might have that, um, again, that power of attorney might not apply where someone um, is acting irrationally, mentally incapacitated, where guardianships can, guardians can be appointed to mm. take away or remove someone's rights to make decisions in a corporate sense. Uh, you see it with insolvency, undertakings, receivers, managers, um, liquidators, and so a receiver is, is appointed where someone owes or a company owes money to a creditor and the creditor hasn't got the money and they're entitled to get the money and they appoint someone to go and get money and that takes the control of the running of that company away from those people so mm. today is really about what that looks like and how that happens in a body corporate sense but particularly today frank we're going to try and address a few myths which exist around administrators it's a bit of a misunderstood topic for a lot of people and it's easy to see why like from my perspective i can i can understand why people have that misconception about it when people are in situations where their body corporate seems really problematic um they of course will default to uh, the nuclear option let's get somebody in there to take control and rest it all back and make it work um and i get it that's a lot that's attractive about that, Frank, of course, but it's never that simple. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's actually much, 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 much more difficult than that. Frank, from the lawyer perspective, what, what do you hear from clients who, who come to you with that kind of discussion? Well, I get the question a lot. Um, and that, you know, and that we're talking about some of the myths that uh, we're busting today as to why it won't work. And when you look at um, practice direction 17, so the commissioner's office is, really good in terms of the information they put on their website. Like even um, our bylaw enforcement chart from, I don't know, six months ago, Chris, that you were involved mm -hmm. in doing. Um, there's a step-by-step -step process to enforcing bylaws. So if, you, if you're not sure and you're a lay person, you want to go look at it, you go to that chart and it follows it through. So like all things, not all things, but most things with the commissioner's office, they've got a practice direction up, practice direction 17, which talks about the appointment of administrators and if you look at it relative to other bits of free information on their website, it's relatively skinny. You know, there's one, um, and we'll put up a link to that, but when there's one phrase there, um, 
and I'm just bringing it up now because I should have brought it up beforehand and hang on one second, everyone, and I'll read it out to you. What they're very reluctant to do is, and this is number four in this practice direction, appointing an administrator is a significant and serious action as it effectively takes responsibility and control away from the body corporate. Yeah. So adjudicators do it um, only in the most extreme of circumstances. So that is about as much of the guidance as you get as to the basis on which you're going to appoint one. So the issue we have as lawyers is when people come to us and say, whatever, we need an, an administrator, we're entitled to an administrator. Um, the first issue is that it's not the body corporate making the application. So suddenly it's not mm -hmm. that great legal phrase, OPM, other people's money. You're not spending body corporate funds, you're spending your own funds mm -hmm. to be able to do that. So, and as always, um, because these things aren't done lightly, you've got to make sure that there's proper grounds there to do it. Because there's no point firing an application with a whole bunch of emails whinging about things, with due respect to the people that are our clients. Um, because inevitably, there's going to be responses from the other people. And then, back to that practice direction, it's a really, really serious thing for adjudicators to take the control mm. of the body corporate away from the people of that body corporate. So for us, the biggest legal issue is people have to spend their own money to engage us, to give them advice about whether they're going to have prospects and then make the application with no guarantee of success. Certainly with that first bit, I mean, once where we get to is if we make an application usually, well, not, not even usually, ethically, we're not allowed at law to make an application we don't think has merits. So if we're making one, we think it's absolutely got the legs. But mm. a lot of these things come a cropper at that first stage because people don't want to spend the money to actually understand what their legal position is. So there's not that many of them that happen. And I think that's probably one of the main reasons why. Really good points, Fang. Um, we're going to get to the myths very, very shortly, but really quickly, some basics about administrator. Who or what is an administrator? Well, as Frank said just then it's an external party appointed to take over running the affairs of body corporate in i think it's fair to say the majority of cases it is typically a body corporate manager uh quite uh also it can be a lawyer and you usually find that for the really intense complex buildings where things have gone seriously awry uh yeah. not always though it might be an accountant uh it could be a strata consultant couldn't it I don't know any of those, Frank. Do you know any of those? I don't know. There's one or two lurking, well, one lurking around and chasing work. Um, and, and, and sometimes, yeah, maybe, maybe without throwing himself out there too badly. Um, and occasionally you see the um, uh, the insolvency type professionals lurk into it, you know, like the receivers, the managers, those people that work in the insolvency firms because they're used to being at the front of making decisions for other people through their insolvency careers. But there's not... It's not um, one singular expert, really, is mm. it? No, no, it's not. So, but it's got to be somebody who has, you know, pretty good understanding of how a body corporate works and how it makes decisions, mm. which leads to the next point that we want to make about it. Uh, once the administrator is appointed, they have all the powers uh, of all the voters, don't they, Frank? They do. So, so what? In these things, you don't appoint administrators to committees. So, if a committee's not there then really that's a part five type thing, which is something we're not talking about today. So this is absolutely saying to the administrator, you now have all the powers of the body corporate to do what needs to be done. And then that's why when you put in for one of these things, if you're gonna make an application for administration, you need to put in the details of the administrator themselves as part of the application and their consent and how they're gonna charge and all that sort of thing. Because if an adjudicator so, yeah, you don't make your application saying, I want an administrator. You say, I want Chris Irons as an administrator, and this is why. So I suppose part one of any application is getting across the stage of this body corporate warrants one. And part two is this is an appropriate person to be able to make these decisions for all of these owners. Because if that person makes those decisions, they're going to be binding on all of the owners. So the owners suddenly don't have a say. 
And, and Frank, that can be opposed. Uh, you can have, and it happens quite frequently, that you have situations where somebody applies for the administrator appointment, puts up the nominated person, and then other owners disagree, and in some cases disagree violently that that person should be the administrator, all sorts of reasons why. Uh, and, and it's a really good point, just because you, I'm talking about people watching or listening to this, wanted administrator doesn't mean that you get it just because you want it or you think it. Uh, and even even despite the reason you're applying for it, it still is the case that every owner in the scheme will get an opportunity to comment. So you might have a fellow owner who says, actually, I think things are okay here. Um, I don't agree whatsoever. Uh, so it can be contested. Um, because there'll certainly be a cost burden, won't there? Absolutely. Administrators don't work for free. So suddenly the levies at X are going to become X plus. Yep administration costs plus whatever the administrator then decides to actually make decisions on behalf of the owners which could absolutely. include special levies and the rest of it absolutely frank uh administrators are appointed on application so the government does not step in and appoint an administrator it has to be the individual going to the commissioner's office and seeking it usually an administrator is appointed to do a very specific task so uh, the common ones there, uh, the very common one is administrator is appointed to convene uh, a meeting. So basically with the purpose of getting things back on track uh, to strike levies is another common one. Uh, sometimes it's about to carry out some dedicated work at the building, work that hasn't been done because nobody's been around to decide it. Sometimes it's also the case that the administrator is appointed, and this is really specific cases for some kind of legal action or legal proceedings. So the administrator is appointed to ensure that blah, blah, blah. Uh, we've just put up there on screen some links to two cases and just for contrast. So one's an order in which an administrator was appointed from quite recently and the other is where an administrator was declined by the adjudicator. And you can see, you can have a read of those and see for yourself the rationale of the adjudicator in both of those cases. And I guess back to that, how and for what purpose the administrator is appointed. Uh, the aim is to appoint them very short term. Usually it's three months, sometimes six, uh, but usually three months to get things on track, restore order, and then uh, back to the owners to manage themselves. In I think it's fair to say, Frank, it's an exception, isn't it, if it's a very long term administration? It is, so that'd be, uh well, massive issues, I suppose. And, and certainly the ones, um, we, I suppose my litigators do most of them, but uh, the ones that I was sort of doing early days really related to building work that hadn't been done. So yeah. bodies corporate that have statutory obligations in relation to the repair and maintenance of common property that just weren't doing it. So the owners who were affected got an administrator appointed to enter into building contracts, strike special levies, drive the thing the way mm. it needed to be driven to make sure that the roof stopped leaking, as an example. So yeah, yeah the example they use in the practice direction is a very simple one of calling that general meeting. You know what I mean? Uh, but usually there are a lot more uh, difficult issues than that. Yeah, and another typical one is for whatever reason, um, the levies aren't being collected. Uh, or, or paid. Uh, so basically, the scheme has gone insolvent to a certain extent. So that's another one. The bottom line out of all of that is the adjudicator has to be convinced. And, and really, the adjudicator always begins, and I'm speaking for adjudicators here, why not? The adjudicator <laughs> basically begins from the position they don't want to do it. They don't want to appoint an administrator because that takes away the rights of everyone to participate. So you have to start from that position. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure the balance of proof is sort of really stated in there, but it's almost a criminal one in terms of beyond reasonable doubt that it's necessary. Yep. So it's a really yep. high bar to cross. And that's why from a client engagement perspective for us, it's that investigation to make sure you're going to get there is the key thing. Yeah. So is it yep. really that bad? Because you've got to be careful what you wish for in this case, mm. which leads us very nicely to our myths Frank, that we're going to try and bust right now about administration. So let's kick into it. The first one, and this is probably the most common myth that I think we would hear. The myth, we have lots of disputes at our scheme, so that means we get an administrator. Frank? No, 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 no. So, and here's, I suppose, the reality with all of these things is that the more people you put together, the more differences of opinion you're going to get. 
Mm. And some of those differences of opinion can be very strongly held, um, very emotionally held. And again, I suppose, Chris, we've spoken about this for a lot of these webinars, mm. where in a business sense, you know, you find someone you don't like in business, you move away, you never see them again. And again, you, you don't watch our webinars again and you're done. Um, but in a residential sense, when you're living with that dispute, it's really easy to become more emotionally involved. And as a result, those things escalate. But the existence of dispute and differences of opinion is in itself not grounds for the appointment of an administrator. And I mean, even, um, mate, if you go back to Arctic, um, talking about smoking as an example. Mm. So there's there's an application that came from left field, the adjudications come out and said smoking's a hazard. Um, there would have been who knows how many applications lodged in relation to smoking over the years. There is a point to this story, let me get there. Um, over the years where the adjudicators will look at it and said nuisance and we would have prepared them and looked at nuisance and couldn't get across the line in terms of threshold of proof and all that sort of stuff. And what's happened with Arctic is the adjudicators looked at it in a different way and said, well, ah, oh, there you go. That's what I'm going to do this time. And the point of that story is that you can have arguments and there's legal opinions and all of this stuff, despite this legislation mm. being in place for more than a quarter of a century now, that is still a new interpretation of something that's 25 years old. So you are absolutely going to have differences of opinion over legal issues. All right because that's interpretation of legislation, that sort of stuff. We've probably got a few of them winging their way through the modules, the new modules now in terms of some of those new provisions. Some of those things are going to be litigated. And yeah. then, of course, um, you're going to have differences of opinion over things that aren't legal, like what colour we should paint the building. Yep. And those might be strongly held views. But the fact that you've got a strongly held view that doesn't agree with your neighbour or isn't consistent with your neighbour isn't grounds for the appointment of administrator. So that's probably myth bus number one for me. It it's, doesn't matter how firm you might be on your view, that's the nature of the body corporate democracy. Yep. You've got an opinion, you're entitled to exercise it as is everyone else. And also remembering that if there are disputes, there's a forum to resolve them. So you can't then say that a lot of disputes mean we should have an administrator. A lot of disputes mean that either things aren't being done in a preventative way or you're not taking advantage of the systems in place to resolve them in any event. And I think the point you were making there, Frank, just to finish this one off, is that you can have a lot of disputes. Um, that doesn't mean that things aren't getting done. Um, the two are not mutually exclusive. So you can have people at loggerheads all the time, but bills are getting paid, decisions are getting made, maintenance getting done. Two things not mutually. Everything's getting pursued, bloody yep. pool. Yeah, everything, everything, everything else is fine. We've just got a mm. massive argument over the port cashier or whatever it might be. That's it. Mm. The rest of the building's functional. So an adjudicator would look at that and say, "Well, that's not systemic in a sense. Yep. That's not building wide. That's that discrete particular issue." Absolutely. Which okay. kind of leads to our next myth, Frank. Uh, so the myth here is that our committee is often at loggerheads. That's surely grounds for an administrator. No. And again, we're sort of really, you'd say the macro is the whole of the body corporate, not mm -hmm. necessarily agreeing. But even then, the whole of the body corporate not agreeing might be two different people who've created followings of their particular point of view. So the 10 owners on one side and the 10 mm. owners on the other, with the other 80 not caring, isn't necessarily uh, a dis uh, something for, that would re sorry, something that would necessitate the appointment of an adjudicator. And then you come down to committee level and that same thing happens. Uh, you now, if we've got three, three, and, and it does happen all the time where factions get appointed, supporters get appointed. I don't know how many times, well, mate, you and I have both seen it, mm. is it's pretty rare to have a committee of seven really strong, independently minded personalities. Usually okay. you've got one that rules the roost and then you might have someone who might be representative of another faction who might have the minority. There might be four, three, and mm. that's as much as it usually goes. But that is, the, that is the same parallel as what we were just talking about with disputation at general meeting level. The difference of opinion in itself is not grounds for the appointment of administrator. And we're back to, are things still being done? Mm. 
is the body yep. corporate still doing what it has to do? Is it, are the committee still making decisions? They might be contested decisions. Owners might not necessarily be happy with those decisions. There might be complaints coming in from owners about that, inevitably, driven by probably yep. the people on the smaller <laughs> faction. <laughs> um, and you then, and then I suppose you look at the corporate governance around that decision making, the quoting, the process, mm -hmm. the notification to owners. If you're in the standard module, perhaps there's the ability to challenge decisions and overturn them before they're given effect and all that sort of stuff. But a difference of opinion in itself is not grounds for appointment of administrator. And um, I think just to touch upon the point you raised there, Frank, if the committee is deadlocked pretty much all the time, that's a different story. Um, so that could indeed be grounds to appoint an administrator. But you'd have to demonstrate that, I don't know, maybe over six to 12 months, every single time issues went to the committee, it was the same every time, two or three or and as, whatever. And as a result of that, this mm. hasn't happened and this hasn't happened. And I suppose yeah. even then, it's not the body corporate that's going to spend the money to make that application. Mm. It's one of the committee groups. And again, I suppose we have run them for people where a group of owners contributed. Obviously, sharing the cost is a much better way to go than someone dipping out of their, their own pocket. Um, so that one, the deadlock one would be really interesting and you'd really... Um, I suppose it'd be one for sort of a little bit of, you know, trying to be as objective as you could be about the legal judgment in terms of, is this serious enough? Yeah. Uh, are we having disagreements to the extent that the body corporate's basic functions are not being given effect to, or is it just an argument over again, what color we're gonna paint the wall in the pool? Absolutely. Got a couple of comments coming through. We'll, we'll get to those towards the end of today. We'll move on to the next myth, and this veers into the financial side of things, this one. So the myth, I think our levies are far too high. We need an external administrator to come in and sort that out. Well, that's grounds, isn't it, Frank? Absolutely, because an external administrator is surely going to cut the levies. <laughs> um, and that's the thing, I suppose. It, it's um, bodies corporate usually, not usually, they're not creatures of discretionary spending. So I did, I did notice back on my little doomsday box, see PayPal had a profit warning in the States the other day. Um, all, of the, all of the economic stimulus has disappeared, so people now aren't buying stuff online. So that's true discretionary spending. I've got the stimulus check, I'm spending it. Boom, boom. Stop, PayPal goes. Bodies corporates don't have discretionary spending abilities. They've got statutory obligations to insure, to administer, to maintain common property, pay their management rights, Mm. Caretaking contract if they got it, pay their body corporate manager if they've got it, probably some R&M, but they don't go on holidays. They don't buy flowers. Um, they don't buy beers or champagne for a Friday night. They so usually, anyway, no, Christmas parties are a separate story. We'll talk about that later. Um, so levies in themselves um, should ordinarily only be what's necessary to be spent. And absolutely, you might be able to, um, if you're outside fixed contracts, cut some costs somewhere but you would be hard pressed to think it's going to be to the extent that it justifies the appointment of an administrator because the committee spending is so profligate it's not funny. Now, it might yeah. be if they're running off, um, let's pick on lawyers for a minute, if they're running off commencing legal proceedings, spending 30 grand on doing so and there's no special levy, so no, sorry, no special resolution, no special levy to fund it and there's nothing in the budget for it and they haven't got two quotes. Maybe, but that's not really the levies are too high. That is the committee decision making is appalling mm. and they should not be allowed to run away and do these things. But high levies, because the other thing, Chris, I suppose, is where do levies get decided? Levies get decided at a general meeting. And that means that if you are a financial and an owner, then you get to cast your vote on levies. So you can't sit there and say, oh, the levy's just increased and I didn't know about it and have any say. No, you did have a say. You can either vote no or better still, you put up your own uh, proposal or better still than that, you get involved in the process. But the actual high levies themselves, that's not grounds. And maybe a couple of other quick financial related ones, Frank. Uh, money going missing or misappropriation, that could in fact be grounds for administration. Yep. I've seen, seen one order made along those lines. Uh, no levies actually being paid or getting struck, quite possibly, in that case. A few things to happen before then. Well, there's plenty um, of opportunity to challenge those things and make those things happen. Like an administrator is the Armageddon option. 
yep. there's ways right. to d deal with body corporate, you should be doing this yep. <laughs> rather than I want an administrator. Which leads to the last one of the financial ones, Frank, if there's a whole bunch of levies outstanding, I would say no, that's not grounds for administration because what that means is that committee is obliged to collect levies in a certain period of time. Now, if there's no committee to do it or the decision to do it keeps getting deadlocked or not followed through, separate story. But simply because levies are outstanding, no, not by itself. Um, the one last thing I'd add to that yep. is it's the usual um, where we have clients come to us and complain about a decision made at general meeting. And the first question you have to ask them because it's absolutely relevant in terms of the application mm -hmm. is which way did you vote? And if they haven't voted, it is exceedingly unhelpful to the prospects in their application. Doesn't well, mean they're going to lose. <laughs> It, well, it does, because that's the first question the commissioner's office will ask them as well. Um, our final myth, and it actually goes towards a couple of the questions that David, David, thank you for watching, yes. has posed to us. Um, so the myth, an administrator will solve all of our problems, particularly in relation to the really awful owners next door. Utopia restored. Frank, surely? No. No, well... Sometimes um, you've got to make a decision between two bad choices. That That's the unfortunate reality. And to me, the administration is that. So because you've got on one hand, you know, and I suppose this is most relationship advice. If nothing changes, nothing changes. So I say to clients all the time in these situations, you've absolutely got a choice of continuing to do nothing. Do Leave nothing is always a choice. Absolutely. It's a genuine choice. Do it. Sell. That's another genuine choice. Um, but if you're actually going to do something and you want to stay there and you want to make this better, then one of the things is that, um, you know, in a sense, if people continue to get away with bad behaviour, they will continue to behave badly. So mm. if they're never held to account, and that's what an administration is designed to do in terms of decision making and doing the things the body corporate needs to do, then, for example, the, the, like the, the ones I used previously, fixing, fixing roofs that committees just, and I don't think, to be fair to these, this particular committee that I'm thinking of, I just think they had too much on their plate and they really didn't want to make the hard decisions. And that's sometimes what you're going to do as a committee. So they kept duck shoving it. Our client kept getting, every time it rained, the floor would be saturated. No, administrator appointed, all that stuff done. So from our client's perspective, that was done and fixed. And they can live in their unit. From a committee perspective, it might be one of those things. Um, you know, you've got your head in the sand and it gets bigger and bigger and you want it to go away and then suddenly it's gone. You can come back up. So that yeah. one actually did make things better because it's made the problem go away. But if it's a relationship problem in terms of personalities, then... Um, it might get past whatever your particular issue is at that point in time. But if you're all still living together and you hate each other, that's just an administrator is not going to solve that. It's not. And look, it's a good good point to remember. Administration is by its nature always meant to be relatively short term. That you, so it can happen that you can have multiple administrations at the same building, like over a period of time or keep coming back to it. There are some buildings in particular I'm thinking of where that has happened from time to time. But no, I, I think the idea is it, the administrator themselves can only do so much and the rest of it is back to those involved. I just want to pick up on a couple of more of the questions, David, you've asked. How often do you see body corporates go into administration per year? Not a huge amount of them get through, David. Uh, don't have the exact figures. But I think it's fair to say, and Frank, tell me what you think, but I think it's fair to say that more often than not, it's not successful. Yeah, and I think that's probably because people are making the applications on the basis that they shouldn't be, which is what we've been talking about today. Yep. I absolutely think we've seen some that would have been successful, but unfortunately, they couldn't be funded by the clients. Yep. So, um, and the reality is they've got a business to run. That's that's the, the nature of the world. So it's always those things. It's the same as people say, you know, management rights agreements don't get terminated. They absolutely do. What happens is in the contested ones, the body corporates tend to lose, but the ones that aren't contested, well and truly valid. So it's sort of administration, I suppose, if someone wanted to go through all of the adjudication decisions for the previous 12 months, you'd see how many were applied for and lost, but there's no sort of um, tally in that sense, is there, Chris? No. And the second part of your question, David, good one. Uh, are smaller schemes less than seven uh, or larger schemes more likely to go into administration? Just anecdotally, David, my perspective, definitely smaller. 
it will happen. Um, duplexes are ripe for that sort of thing. Six packs ripe for that sort of thing. What do you think, Frank? Yeah, the amount of fights we've had over insurance in the smaller schemes is extraordinary. In, in bigger schemes, the strata manager strikes the levies, everyone pays the levies, and there's enough owners to make it yeah. work. Smaller schemes, someone says no, then it actually puts a massive hold on the budget. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's right, Frank. Um, we are rapidly approaching the end, so we better quickly do our takeaways out of today. And I think it's the, it's really obvious on this one. Administration, it's a big deal. Um, it bear, it's one of the more serious actions that an adjudicator can take. So you better be sure. And Frank, I think your point right from the start, it probably pays to do the investigation at the start to see if you would actually qualify to get the outcome that you think you want. It's much better doing that and spending that money and time then than going through the whole process to get knocked back right at the end because you didn't do it. Uh, that frames your application anyway. In terms of putting together an application, you've got to get your ducks in a row in terms of what happened yep. when and all that sort of stuff. So that is really a, an evidence gathering exercise. And it's, it's basically your last roll of the dice, the administrator. Mm. You've tried everything else, last go of things. I think that's more or less uh, it for today, everyone. Um, it, it's a big topic, that one. It's one that I think people will kind of watch and listen to, Frank, and then have a bit of a think about afterwards. And if people listening today have had to reconsider what they're thinking, then mission accomplished, I would say. But uh, if it's actually raised some issues for you about your body corporate, get in touch. Uh, if it's crystallised your views, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Again, it's fantastic that you all take the time. Really appreciate that that happens. Um, Frank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you next week.